It is episode 20 of the Karo Khan vs Everything speedrun. Very simple basis of this series. We play the Karo Khan whether we have the white or the black pieces. Try and win, obviously, in a rapid game on chess.com. I try and explain my thought process while we play. We'll have a short analysis afterwards, which I would encourage you to stick around for. Let's get into it. Okay, so we have the white pieces. Obviously, C3 is the move. We're playing a Karo Khan setup against Guitar Koru 010 from, I want to say, the Philippines. Yes, okay. So, obviously, C3, D4 is a Karo Khan. And my opponent, we, we have a reverse Karo, except I'm a move ahead. So, I, I can just take a free pawn. This is the strangest gambit I've ever seen because <laughs> there is just no way this works. I think all we have to do is go bishop f4, knight f3. And how is my opponent winning the pawn back? This knight is also just misplaced on the c6 square because, as I mentioned in my previous video, in these structures, the knight does not belong on c6 because the pawn is supposed to go on either c6 or c5 to support the d5 pawn. With the knight on c6, the d pawn is alone, especially because he's now lost his e pawn. So this is very good news for us. Opponent targets the f2 square. It doesn't matter. He doesn't have any kind of tactics on me. So we're just going to play knight f3. We're going to follow with moves like e3 to block this diagonal off and support the bishop. My opponent goes knight g to e7. So what he wants to do, at least from what I would assume, is he wants to go knight to g6, attacking my bishop and attacking my pawn, trying to win it back. Now, I actually play a very interesting gambit from the white side against the Karo Khan, where this kind of thing actually happens. So I'm somewhat familiar with these positions from uh, the other side, like from what would be the black side, except like it's better in my version of it because this gambit isn't a real gambit. It kind of sucks. Um, I think e3 is the way to go. And after knight g6, I think I willingly give the bishop up and take with the pawn to support the e5 pawn further. I'm pretty sure that's the way I'm supposed to handle the position. So let's do that. e3. Of course, after knight g6, we could drop the bishop back. But I don't think there's a need to, because if knight g6, he's not threatening to win the pawn yet. It's going to be difficult for him to do that. He's probably going to have to castle and put a rook on e8, which takes another couple moves. And if he takes my bishop, we just take back with the pawn. And we have very, very nice control of e5. We can always play g3 to support the f4 pawn. Maybe put our bishop on g3, maybe on b5 to threaten the knight. Or maybe just on a square like d3 to get on this nice diagonal if my opponent castles kingside. So we have a very easy position to play here. Our queenside knight is probably going to come to d2, maybe go to b3 and get onto the dark squares in the center. That could be a very uh, active position. The queen could come out to b3 to put some pressure on b7 and d5, maybe try and put a rook on d1. But we don't have to do that yet. And my opponent goes a6, which I think... I understand he doesn't want to allow bishop to b5 to pin the knight because the knight is obviously fighting for the e5 pawn. But I think that's a little bit of a waste of time. You also give the bishop the a7 square, but the bishop can always drop back to b6 if needs be. So that's not really a concern. Knight d4 would be an interesting move to try and get some kind of trade like this. But my opponent will obviously not allow it because that just fixes my structure and makes it so that he will never win the e5 pawn back. So I think knight bd2 is a perfectly valid move. A move like bishop d3 or bishop e2 is also quite good. But there's no rush. Let's go knight b3 and attack the bishop. Um, obviously opening our queen back up. I think I want to put the bishop on d3. Um, if we do end up giving the e5 pawn back, I don't think I mind that much as long as I get a lot of development in return. If my opponent has to spend a long time trying to win it back. Um, I think that would be fine. Queen d2 followed by rook d1 to threaten the d5 pawn is tempting, but I think my opponent can just go bishop to e6 to defend. So it's not all that impressive. Knight d4 might be useful if he puts the bishop on e6 to put pressure on it, because if we can get the exchange, we will block the e-file off, and it'll be difficult for my opponent to get a rook or a queen to attack the pawn. And then we can drop the bishop back to g3 if knight to g6. And that would be a very nice position because we block the e-file off. I think bishop d3 is very nice. Uh, we stop the bishop coming to f5 easily, which would be an active square. 
And at the end of the day, h7 is incredibly weak. And we might actually have a Greek gift situation if we play our cards right here. Okay, not anymore because of knight g6. Um, but it is definitely a possibility in the future. I'm very tempted to go knight d4. I don't really want to take the knight. I think that would be not a bad move, but it feels unnecessary. My bishop is very strong, and if this knight moves, again, the Greek gift ideas exist um, in the position. So, yeah. By the way, um, Fian Keto Club, uh, which you can see down in the corner of my screen here, make a very nice Greek gift hoodie. Um, I have a t-shirt of it, actually, which a couple videos ago I was sporting. Um, I might release some shorts on the channel wearing it. It's pretty cool. Use my code to get a discount at checkout if you are interested. It's just pretty, like, pretty good chess apparel, to be fair. Knight d4 I don't think works because of knight f4, and if we take the knight, he takes on d3 with check first. So that would not be a good move. We could go bishop to g3, and if rook to e8, then I don't know how we defend the pawn. So we might have to take the knight. If he takes with the f pawn, that feels a bit flimsy. If he takes with the h pawn, maybe we can go h4 to try and play h5. I'd like to have tried to avoid giving my bishop up for the knight, but we may have to. We may have to, just because knight d4 tactically doesn't work out in this position, because taking the bishop comes with check. Um, we just lose a piece there. It's an interesting position, for sure. Um, yeah, we might actually have to take. I'm going to do it. It looks a bit weird. To be trading off my bishop like that, especially given how active it is. But this seems to be the right way forward. Queen d3 is an interesting idea to play rook d1 or castle queenside, actually. To try and put pressure on the d5 pawn. Again, trying to expose the fact that c6 can't be played to defend the pawn. And if bishop to e6 is played, then I can play knight to g5 to go after it. Um, h4, h5 is an idea, but I'd like to get my king safe first, just in case. Um, yeah, queen d3 looks really good to me. I think the only valid way for black to try and defend the position is a move like knight to e7 to play c6. And then I guess the knight can go into f5 after that. But... If something like queen d3, knight e7, castles, queen side, c6, h4, it's going to become very difficult for black to defend his king side properly, especially because this bishop is locked on this very inactive diagonal. The only way it can really get back into the position is c6 and bishop b8, but then it might cause problems for his rook anyway. So I'm going to go queen d3. Again, we have two defenders on the e5 pawn right now. Black has one attacker. It's going to be very difficult for black to get three attackers on it, especially because this bishop cannot access the pawn currently. And if this knight moves to play c6 to get the bishop in the game, that's a long-winded plan. And there's not, an, there's not an obvious other square that this knight can go to to attack this pawn, unless it goes like b8, d7, blocks this bishop off, takes a ton of time. So I think we're going to hold on to this pawn quite easily now. I think trading our bishop off for the knight on g6 was probably the right move. Yes, he is an open F file, but it doesn't really matter because it's so clogged up. And we're going to castle queenside anyway. If the bishop drops back to g3, then f2 will be more than well defended. And he'll only have one attacker anyway. So I think this is fine. g5 is also not playable because we have too many defenders on that square. And if we manage to get h4, h5 in, we are going to blow open the either the h or the g file... Or we're going to win a pawn. Say we go like h4, h5, and black goes g5 to try and keep things closed. We're just going to go up another pawn. I think I kind of blundered bishop to f5 here. I don't know why I didn't see that. That's just a good move. It just attacks the queen. The queen probably belongs on d2. But um, it's not the end of the world. And yeah, my opponent goes for this plan, which, I mean, it looks like a decent enough plan. 
Um, I don't know why I didn't see bishop f5. And I don't know why he didn't see it either. But if he plays it, we just drop back to d2. It's not ideal. Uh, I'd rather it not come with a tempo. But whatever. I'm playing a bit quicker this game compared to what I tend to do on this channel. Which means that hopefully I will not lose on time. Whoa, c5. That is bold. Obviously, c4 with a fork is the idea. I think we should just preemptively move back to d2. We also ensure that bishop to f5 does not come with a tempo on our queen anymore. We make sure c4 doesn't attack our queen. If c4 is played, we just go knight d4. Black's pawn structure becomes very clogged up, and the d5 pawn becomes even weaker, because if c5 is played, the d5 pawn becomes a backwards pawn, because it cannot be supported by another pawn. Yeah, this is just a massive weakness. And yes, he is getting a very strong grip on the light squares in the position. But his dark squares are becoming very weak. And the d5 pawn is going to potentially suffer in the future. I think... Well, I'm obviously not going to play knight to a1. <laughs> um, that would be a bit ridiculous. So, knight bd4. If the bishop takes... I think we actually take back with the queen. You could argue... Obviously, you don't take back with the... You could take back with the e-pawn, actually, because the queen defends the bishop. But... And you could take back with the c-pawn to support the e5-pawn. But I'm more tempted, if he takes, which he won't, to take with the queen or the knight. Probably the queen. So that I can keep the d-file open and keep the pressure on this backwards pawn. I think that would be the best way to go about that position. A knight on d4 is also very nice, because if bishop to f5, we can just snap it off the board. Uh, and also the knight on e7 means the queen no longer supports the g5 square. So h4, h5 is going to become even more difficult for my opponent to deal with. We're already up a pawn in this position. And h4, h5 is going to cause some problems because of the opposite side castling. Black can certainly try something like b5, b4 to try and open up the like my queen side. But I don't think I'm that concerned. I think my attack probably strikes a bit harder. But we'll see. We'll see. Um, by the way, if this is the first time you're seeing this channel, or if you've been watching my videos for a while and you haven't yet subscribed, I would really appreciate it if you could drop a subscription. And hopefully more of my videos can show up on your homepage and you get to see more, well, mid-quality chess content. Um, okay. Bishop g4 is an interesting idea. I think I just go h3 though. Because you can't retreat because I trap your bishop. And if you take, I'm just going to take back with the pawn. Which opens up the g file. And then this pawn is still going to move up the board anyway. Also, if this bishop vacates this diagonal. Then knight to e6 will be a fork. So that could be an issue for black. I don't want to go h4 because now he actually has control of the h5 square. So I need to get rid of this bishop first. You could make the argument for if bishop f3 going knight to f3. That's definitely viable. And maybe it's actually better. Because this knight supports e5 and also can hop to g5. To get involved in the attack. This bishop also becomes more obsolete. Because it will be targeting nothing. Just an e3 pawn. Okay, my opponent goes bishop back to d7, which is probably the pragmatic move. Because uh, now if I go h4, then bishop goes back to g4 to defend the h5 square. But I'm tempted to go e6 to block this bishop out of this diagonal and then push the pawn. And if um, after e6, bishop takes d4 to remove the defender, I just take back with the knight. It also frees my bishop up, so it no longer has to defend this pawn, and also opens up this long diagonal, which could be useful. So, all very good options. I think e6 makes the most sense here. So I'm going to play it. This opens up the bishop. It blocks this bishop off. We're ready to push on the king side now, and open the position up. If this knight falls, then I'm not too fussed. All that will do if he takes and takes is mean that my bishop uh, has, a has a monopoly over the dark squares um, in the position, which could be quite useful, especially on like this diagonal. Or if my bishop can root itself to the d4 square and become very, very powerful. 
But yeah, this is just a very nice position, really. We definitely have an advantage. Our king is very safe. We are castled opposite sides, so of course there are possibilities of black launching a pawn storm. That absolutely exists. But I think, again, ours lands quicker and harder because of these double pawns. Wow, bishop e8. I guess that still supports the h5 square. He really doesn't want to let me in, and I don't blame him. It's worth considering a move like knight e5 just to launch myself into the position, but if he takes the knight, I'd rather take back with the knight, so I'm supporting the six pawn, so maybe not the best course of action. Um, Can I try and brute force this anyway? And maybe go like h4, g4, and h5, maybe? This bishop's doing some good defensive duties, to be fair. I didn't really consider that as an option to go back to e8. I was expecting, like, the bishop to go to c6, to be honest. Bishop g5 is a viable move, just to put the bishop on an active diagonal. But if bishop g5, just like queen d6, and it doesn't make as much sense anymore, because I'm not pinning the knight to the queen. My opponent's putting up some stiff resistance here. I think he's definitely defending himself well. I think h4 still makes sense, though. My only issue with g4 is my knight could be vulnerable, but I suppose the knights always support each other, and if this knight ever gets taken, then this knight just replaces it. And f2 is defended by the queen. So g4, I think I'm going to play. I'm going to play g4 rather than h4 first because I want to stop anything from coming to the f5 square that could potentially be annoying. They're probably interchangeable uh, playing either of these moves, but I think this is a bit more restrictive of my opponent's plans. a5 I don't think is the way to go unless he's trying to go b5, b4, which makes sense. If he goes a4, his attack completely fails because I go a3, I lock down the b4 square, and he has no real way in. I think our attack lands a lot quicker though, because h4, h5 is on the way. And I don't see... Yeah, no, a4 is not the plan. That is not the plan. Uh, obviously, if my opponent gets a3 in, then absolutely that works. But we just go a3 ourselves, lock down the b4 square. He could try and force some files open, but he'd have to sack quite a few pawns, and I don't think he would really get anywhere with it anyway. Uh, yeah, this bishop's doing a good job defending both of these important squares. But the problem is that h5 is about to land. And I can maybe shift the queen onto this diagonal, which could cause more damage, bring the knight out to g5 potentially. This pawn is very restrictive of my opponent's position. And it's also difficult for him to really attack. I can always bring my bishop to e5 to go after the dark squares. This is just a very nice position in general. And I think we could hopefully create some kind of landslide. Okay, queen b6. That's not a good move. That's my first reaction. Because he's not doing anything. He can't go to b3 anyway. b2 is more than well protected. He's blocking his own bishop out. He's attacking e6, I suppose, but the knight is defending e6, and the bishop can't take the knight anymore. So I think we just go h5. And we just continue plugging away. We also don't have to do anything yet, because we can always go h6 if we want. We can take, we can leave the tension, we can go g5 if we feel like it. We don't have to commit to anything right now. Leaving the pawn on g4 might be a good idea, just to keep the f5 square occupied and not allow the knight to get back into the game and potentially cause some annoyance by like trying to trade itself off. We are, remember, still up a pawn. So whilst I would love for this attack to just crash through and checkmate my opponent, we don't need to. We are just up a pawn, and this is a very dangerous pass pawn. Okay, bishop b8 offers me a bishop trade. I think I should... I could decline it and go bishop g5, actually. I could accept, or I could decline it and say, what is your bishop doing on b8, mate? And put pressure on the knight. Let's say bishop g5, bishop d6 to defend the knight. The b pawn can't move anyway because the queen's in the way. We could go knight to e5. 
and put some more pressure on the light squares. And if he wants to give me the bishop for the knight, then I think I take that. Like I said before, my bishop will now have really strong control over the dark squares. We could. T I, I don't want to leave it hanging because I don't really want to do this with my pawn structure. I don't think it wouldn't be the end of the world, but I'm not sure. Maybe that would be fine. And then we open up the e-file to support our pawn from behind. It's an interesting idea. This knight also now has the freedom to go to g5 because it no longer needs to support this knight, which would defend d6 and put pressure on the light squares. This bishop's also supported by the queen, so we have, you know, two attackers versus two defenders. That's fine for us. Knight g5 looks very tempting, to be fair. Really does. I'm going to play it. I don't think I'm blundering anything here. I think we just have two very strong knights controlling a lot of important squares in the position. We maintain our pawn's control of f5. If my opponent trades, he's just spent two moves doing that, right? And that might just be an improvement to our pawn structure. Maybe we can even try and go f5 in the future to um, break open some more avenues of attack and maybe crack open the g-file if we have some kind of trade on f5. So that's also a very good possibility. Yes, my king is potentially vulnerable on the light squares, but it's not obvious how black actually accesses those, especially since b3 can't be accessed. And even if it is, it would just be my opponent's queen involved. The files remain shut on the queen side, meaning his rooks can't do a whole lot, unless he does some weird rook lift, but I'm defending that anyway. Um, and this light squared bishop is going to struggle to get involved because of my pawn presence on the queen, on, sorry, on the king side. So those are all, you know, massive positives of the position. And we still, you know, can choose what we want to do on the king side, depending on how the position evolves. Um, there's, I don't think there's any massive rush to make a like, big committal decision here. I think we can... Obviously, we want to play the most, like, positionally restrictive and aggressive moves here. But we don't need to throw everything at my opponent and hope for a quick checkmate. Let's take back. Taking there might be my opponent's best option. Okay, he goes queen c7, targeting that pawn, which I did briefly consider. I didn't think it was that scary, though. Um... Okay, what are my options? Taking on g6 looks very tempting. If my opponent takes on f4. Oh, there is a disgusting tactic there. If takes, takes. Takes on h7. The king has to go to h8. And then knight to f7 check. Cuts off the connection to the queen. If rook takes, we win an exchange. If bishop takes, we win the queen, because the rook's connection to the queen is cut off. That's really, really nice. And if we take and the pawn takes, we open up the h-file. If we take and the bishop takes, then we can go f5, attacking the bishop, cutting the rook's connection to f4 off. And then this pawn chain will be absolutely incredible. I'm pretty sure I've calculated that correctly. If rook takes... Uh, I mean, yeah, you can do that, but the rook looks a bit awkward there. Um, maybe that's the best idea. Okay, the bishop does take, so we don't get to take on h7 with tempo. That would have been a beautiful little tactic, but I'll show you after the game if you're not following me. Uh, that's not a problem. Remember, if you have any questions about this game, uh, just as long as you timestamp it below, I will answer anything you may have a query on. Yeah, f5 is clearly the move here. The bishop is forced back to e8. We can win the h7 pawn. And my opponent's position is completely falling apart now. The rook is cut out of the game. The knight is cut out of the game. The bishop is cut out of the game because of this amazing pawn structure that we've got going on here. Just, like, constricting my opponent's position to the max. That is absolutely my play style. I love this kind of chess where I just feel like anything I do is going to win and there's nothing my opponent can do about it. I absolutely love it. Uh, whoa, why did I do that?
Bear with me. Bear with me. Okay, we're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. But yeah, my opponent has no choice. And if we take with the knight on h7, he actually just loses, loses the exchange because the rook has nowhere to run. That's how constricted his position is. Even though he doesn't have that many pieces, he just has nowhere to move. He has nowhere to put them. He blocked his own attack off with the move um, a4. And we played a3, and he has no way into the queen side. His queen and his dark square bishop did a bit of a dance, wasted a lot of time. This bishop's been popping in and out of the position for the last 10 moves. And at the end of the day, our knights are just situated on dark squares where his light squared bishop cannot attack them. Our pawns are controlling the light squares. Our knights are controlling the light squares. These pawns are controlling the dark squares. We have a massive vice on the king side, an open h file. We can, we can always do stuff like f4 and queen h2 to access the h file once the h pawn disappears. There is absolutely no way my opponent can survive for like another 10 moves. I guarantee there is a checkmate within the next 10 moves, no matter what he does. Um, of course, after bishop to e8, like we don't want to go f4, queen h2 immediately because he can play h6, which I'm sure there's still a win there, but he does block the file off, uh, which obviously just means that he can last a bit longer. I know I've been saying he the whole time, but my opponent might be a girl. That's just how I talk. I just say he to refer to my opponent. There is no ulterior motive there. But those of you who may have been annoyed the whole video at me saying he. Anyway, I'm sure that's um, a very small minority of viewers, if any at all. Um, yeah, I mean, this position, I kind of just said everything that needs to be said with it, to be honest. Like, Vicaro Khan strikes again. And my opponent just played a very strange gambit, like... It just clearly doesn't work. This is not any kind of theory. My opponent might have just got confused and tried to play a reverse Karo Khan not realising that he was black. I don't know. But either way, um, he does not play this position correctly at all. Um, uh, I mean, he, he plays logical moves, of course. But after the bishop gets traded for the knight, there's just no way to win the e5 pawn back. Queen d3 was a wrong move. My opponent should have gone bishop to f5. Whether that would have made a whole lot of difference, I don't know. Um, but bring, in the queen, bring the queen back to d2. Get rid of any possibilities. Um, but c4, again, was not the right idea. He definitely should have been trying to go for d4 at some point to crack the position open. That would have been how I would have tried to go about the position as the black pieces. How that would have been achieved... Like, exactly, I couldn't tell you. But I think that's definitely the idea he should have been aiming for. h6 is an accurate move, I think. If takes, takes, queen takes. That's still crushing. We just go over, like, queen h5 and then checkmate him. So, um, unless he's going to take the pawn. No, he doesn't. I think this is game over regardless. Uh, I, oh, maybe his idea is queen g5, queen f4, check. Forcing a queen exchange. We would be up two pawns there. Like, that's good. But that's, int that's, that's quite a nice way for my opponent to try and hold on to this position, to be fair to him. This is still completely winning. But we'll go into an interesting endgame, for sure. I think we should take. Um, because then we just get the queens off the board. Uh, forcefully. After, yeah, yeah, so we trade here, and then f3 is the move I want to play. f3, because the knight defends the pawn, the pawn defends g4, and the knight is well defended. If f3, knight c6, trying to trade knights. Maybe that's an idea for my opponent. Hmm. g6 is also hanging. But that's not the end of the world. Um, We could consider knight to e2. But then he just takes on f2 with an attack on the knight. So probably not. This is a very pragmatic decision from my opponent. Knight f5 is interesting. Trying to win the d5 pawn. And get some exchanges. If knight f5. 
if something like knight g6, then like rook to d5, let's say rook f2, um, that looks pretty good to me because this pawn gets through and these pawns are weak. If knight f5 takes, 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 he defends d5. Uh, I'm not sure what we do there. We could go pawn e7, rook e8, rook e1. And it becomes very difficult for black to move. Because his king can't do anything. And he's always threatened with back rank mates. That's an idea. Um, That might be the best plan going knight f5. Trying to facilitate some trades. If he does something like, I don't know, rook e8. Then takes, 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 takes. Mm, check. Rook f8, rook d1. That should be a winning endgame. Because the king will be stuck on the back rank and the rook won't be able to do a whole lot um, in terms of like taking pawns because he'll get back ranked or we can force an exchange. I'm going to go knight f5. It feels like the right move to me. To me, this feels like the way to go because we're up two pawns. This pawn structure isn't great anyway because if this pawn was on f5, it'd be perfect. But the pawns are very split up. So if I can sack a couple of pawns on the king side to win a bunch of queenside pawns and get a lot of activity, then we should still be at a material advantage there. Okay, yeah, let's take. And I think e7 is the move. If this rook ever takes on f2, we take on d5. And g6 is not obvious how black wins that without losing a lot of other pawns. e7 is also an important move, I think, because the king can't go to f8. I know my opponent can go rook e5, but then we just go rook e1. Force an exchange. Pin my opponent's rook down to the e8 square. His king can't go anywhere because he's cut off from all angles. And then we just bring our king in. Okay. Rook to g5. That's a pragmatic move, trying to win the g6 pawn to get his king into the game. Uh, I think rook e1 threatening promotion is the way to go. Let's do it. So rook e8 is forced. And then we can probably go rook to e6, actually. To defend g6 and e7. This rook puts pressure on d5. We might just be able to bring our king into the position somehow. Because these two pawns and this rook are literally paralyzing this king, this rook. They're paralyzed. This rook can't do a whole lot because I'm attacking the d5 pawn. If he takes here, then he just loses. Because I'm going to go rook to e8 and it's game over. Because the king can't support the rook. So that's pretty good. We could consider rook e1 to bring this rook around to d8 as well. That's also a good plan. We could go rook d2, rook e2, rook d6, and something like rook d8. Like that. That's also an option. I think rook d2 I like, because I don't know what my opponent does there. I don't know what he does. Maybe it's unnecessary, but I kind of like it. Let's just simply defend with rook d2. Hold on to this pawn. We're defending everything. We're attacking the weakness that I pointed out like 10 moves ago. Yeah, rook f6, we go rook to e2. To, you know, if he exchanges, then we just go rook e6. And our rook keeps the king and the rook at bay. There is nothing he can do. We just bring our king in and it's game over. If we take on f6, we give the king the g7 square to escape. So I don't really want to do that. That is not something I want to do. I mean, rook f6 does stop rook d6, rook to d8. Because obviously we'd hang a rook. That's true. That's true. Again, it's not totally obvious how we're going to make progress. We could consider, though, playing f4. Because if the rook takes, 
Well, then if rook d6, the rook comes back, but then we go rook d8 and my opponent loses. So that would be winning. And if we get f4, f5 in, then we're just defending stuff very nicely. Although there's still not an obvious breakthrough then. I suppose what we could do, if we get f4, f5, rook 2 to e5, then we can bring our king in without cutting the connection between the rooks. So that is a possibility as well. Although, maybe we can bring the rook up to e5 anyway. Because if the rook takes on f2, again, we can go for this idea of bringing a rook to the d file to get to d8 and force this rook to either exchange itself and then we queen, or he just loses a rook because he can't defend it with the king and he can't defend it with the rook. So, yeah, this is pretty winning. Although, in fairness, my opponent has put up a pretty staunch defense of this very losing position. Um, they've come up with some good ideas to try and hang on. But I don't think that it can last all that much longer here. Uh, I'm very happy about the position we've got. And I would love to be able to bring my king into the game um, a bit more easily. But it's difficult because... I'm restricted on a lot of the squares that I can access currently. It would maybe be a shout to run my king over like this, but I don't think... It... Well, I suppose it might do something, because I might force this rook to make a decision, because if I win the pawn like that, it's game over. Okay, I think rook f4 loses to rook d6, because now he can't take me. Although I suppose my opponent was in Zugzwang regardless. There was nothing he could really do. Maybe he's trying to play d4, but it doesn't do anything. Rook d6 should be winning. Let's do it. The e-pawn is defended by the other rook. Um, the only way for my opponent to try and survive... Well, it doesn't work. Is Oh no, it really doesn't work. Because if takes, 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 the idea is to deflect my rook from the defense of e7. Then I just go rook to d8, the king is stuck on the back rank, he has to sack his rook, and he gets checkmated anyway. So again, the pawn on g6 comes in clutch massively in this position. So yeah, whether I misplayed the attack a little bit towards the end, maybe. Maybe there was a quicker knockout, but this might have just been a very easy way to go about the position, like sort of a no-risk situation. Uh, we'll see what the computer says in the analysis we do after the game. Don't worry, it will be short. I won't take too much of your time on that because I know people prefer to watch the gameplay anyway. But we'll probably find some interesting stuff that the computer has to say about the position and maybe some stuff that you guys actually noticed and I didn't. Uh, whether you've commented that already, maybe before the analysis. But there might be something obvious or something, some interesting concept that I missed during the game because, of course, I am absolutely not perfect. I think my opponent is now realizing there's nothing he can do and the only way for him to survive would probably be for him to give up a rook, which obviously he doesn't want to do. Um, but the alternative is just losing like really, really badly. Although that would happen either way in this position, unfortunately for my opponent. Yeah, he brings the rook back, but it's too little too late. Uh, now I get to play rook d8 and... The rook is pinned to the king. So he either takes me and I queen and rook f8 and rook e8 and my opponent is getting checkmated. Or he does nothing and I take and then rook f8 and then takes and he gets checkmated. Or there's not a whole lot else. <laughs> Those are really the only options. Or he just gets taken. Uh, there's, yeah. I mean, he could go rook f8. And if takes, takes, he's still losing, but he survives for longer. If rook f8, we of course just take this. Um, and then it's game over because rook takes and rook to e8 would be the most accurate way to go about it. Because we either win the rook with check and he loses, or he takes and takes and he gets back ranked anyway. So clearly this is a game about restriction. We restricted my opponent's pieces. And in this end game, once we got to the end game, my opponent's king and rook have been massively restricted by my pawns and my active rooks. Well, my rooks supporting the pawns, really. And now my opponent just didn't really have a whole lot that he could do. Makes a mistake, allows my rook in, and the game is over. So 
very um a very me game a game that i quite enjoyed uh just because of the way that the position played out it was my kind of positional constriction that i enjoy so much let me know what you guys thought of the game but let's get into a quick analysis and see what the computer has to say okay so a very successful game um 87.9 percent accuracy for myself which considering the game went on for quite a while i'm very happy with my opponent was 72.7, which is not bad at all for their rating. So let's get into it. Obviously, this kind of position, my opponent should just be playing normal moves like knight f6, knight f3, bishop f5, like knight bd2. So th these sorts of moves, just jostling for control of the center. But my opponent goes e5, which is just clearly a bad move. And we take knight c6. is also a bad move. The computer wants to justify this by gambiting the f-pawn, so gambiting a pawn completely, to open up the f-file, get some quick development, castle kingside with an open f-file probably, and that makes a lot more sense. My opponent though tries to win the pawn back. Bishop f4 is a mistake. Knight f3 first was better. Because of g5, bishop g3, knight g to e7, Oh, I think the point is if knight f3, then g4 can be played to kick the knight away. Wow. I mean, without knowledge of this opening or a significant amount of time to think about it, g5 is a difficult move to play, but it makes sense once you see it. If you, for some reason, encounter this position, knight f3 is the move. f4 is not typically the move in this kind of position. I play the reverse of not this exact position, but a kind of reverse of this from the black side, except I'm white. Because the idea is if f4 is played, you gambit the pawn, and then you claim that e4 is a massive weakness because this pawn has advanced too far, and the e-pawn becomes a backwards pawn, which it absolutely is. And black is just even better then. So, okay, my opponent misplays it. Bishop c5, knight f3, knight g7, e3. And the computer likes bishop g3, but my point is, if knight g6, I can retreat the bishop, but I can also just ignore him and play something like knight bd2 and if we get this exchange then it's going to be very difficult for my opponent to win this pawn back my opponent goes a6 though presumably to stop bishop b5 knight bd2 castle knight b3 kicking the bishop out bishop d3 the computer likes knight coming to d4 but i mean i don't think it's that big a deal bishop d3 knight g6 here i didn't think this worked because well, you can't do this because of this, but you can just take back, to be fair. And if knight d4, cd4, this is an incredibly strong center, and white is just very, very winning, in my opinion. But whatever. We go bishop takes g6, which isn't the best, but it's fine. fg6, queen d3, not the best move because of bishop to f5, but it's not the end of the world. Knight e7. We castle queenside and we're worse. That's crazy. That's crazy. C5 is a good move. We go queen d2. C4 is a mistake though. Um, uh, the computer's screaming for h6. I assume so that when h4, h5 is played, then g5 can be played with support to shut things down on the king side, which makes a lot of sense. You go c4 though. Gives me the d4 square. Bishop g4. And... I did consider the move bishop g5. Oh no, I, I considered it later. But the computer likes it in this position. I go for h3, offering an exchange here. And you can take with the pawn or the knight. They're basically the same evaluation. And then just throw this pawn down the board. Again, the computer, the um, opponent can try h6. So if I push forward, can go g5. But d5 is a massive weakness because the c-pawn has advanced too far. In my opinion, you either put the pawn on c6 to support the d5-pawn, or the pawn stays on c5 to try and support a d5, sorry, a d4 thrust. In my opinion, that is the way you have to handle this position as the black pieces. My opponent retreats to bishop, e6. We cut the bishop off further. Bishop to e8, g4, a5, h4. And here, I was expecting the move b5 which black is still losing, but you have more of a chance to fight. He goes for a4, a4, sorry. 
which the computer thinks is the best move, which is crazy to me. But I just go a3 and the queen side is completely locked. Queen b6 again, not the best idea. It doesn't really do a whole lot. h5, we continue pushing on the queen side, sorry, the king side. Bishop b8. And here I had to decide what I wanted to do. <clears throat> Whether I wanted to exchange or take or what. I went for knight g5, not the most accurate move, but it's fine. Bishop f4, ef4, queen c7, which is nice to go after the pawn. And here we do play the most accurate move, hg6. The position I wanted to happen so badly was queen f4, gh7 check, king h8, and knight to f7. If you take with the bishop, whoops, you lose your queen. So, if rook f7, defending the queen, then we just take the rook. And if we get some kind of exchanges, then we just up an, an exchange and a pawn. And this is completely losing for black. So this is what I wanted to happen. My opponent took with the bishop instead. Rook f4 was the more accurate move, which I did mention. But I thought we were still absolutely fine. Rook h7 is good. Taking with the pawn is good. Taking with the knight is good. Everything is good. My opponent goes for bishop takes. f5, h6. Which was very pragmatic. Because if the bishop goes back to e8... I was going to play knight h7, you lose the rook, because if you go to f6, you still lose the rook. And I'm about to go f4, queen h2, and you're about to lose. So h6 is the best move. Very nice find from my opponent. I take on g6, hg5, queen g5. Not the best move. Knight f5 was better. Blocking the rook's access, but can't you still trade... Oh, this would be checkmate. So let's say knight takes first. The computer wants queen d5. Which I am never ever playing in a million years. Oh, I'm completely winning because of this cr really nice geometry. But I did not see this. Uh, we take on g5. And I decided just to go into a better endgame. Here, though, was the position where I needed to be accurate. I like the idea of f3, holding everything together. But just something like knight g6. And I wasn't sure how to advance in this position. Because if I move my knight, I lose the f3 pawn. Computer thinks this is very nice. You invest in the e-pawn, which is kind of what we did in the game. I chose knight f5 because my idea was, if you take on g6, I take on d5. And if you take on g4, then I can push. And this looks really, really good to me. The computer wants to sacrifice to knight. It thinks that's the best way forward. So rook e7 is a massive threat because you either lose a rook or you let me promote if you exchange with me. So my opponent takes on f5 with the knight, gf5, rook f5, I go e7, rook d to e1, or rook h e1 were both good, rook g5, rook h e1, we now force rook e8 because otherwise we promote, then we get rook e6, the only move to hold a significant advantage, we hold everything down in the position, constrict everything, and we have pressure on d5, rook f5, rook d2, basically we just need to get the rook to the e-file, which we did in a roundabout way. Rook f4 is a mistake, but there's nothing for black to do. The computer either wants to give his rook up to get rid of the pawn, or start pushing pawns randomly on the queen side and losing all your pawns, or shuffling the king. And realistically, none of those plans are going to work. If you start shuffling the king, which I was half expecting, this was my plan, to push the pawn forward, go rook 2 to e5, and then I was going to bring my king in like this, win all the pawns, on the queen side and get the c-pawn rolling because like there's nothing that black can do if you exchange then the position is exactly the same you still can't do a thing that was my plan my opponent tries to do something with rook f4 it allows rook d6 and here it's just completely game over i've ran through all the reasons at the end of the game why that is but there is nothing left here for black a very nice game very happy with it we advance closer to 1600 elo on the Cairo khan versus everything account and my opponent just plays a very strange gambit that um, clearly doesn't work, and we capitalized on it. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you want to check out the previous episodes of the Kara Khan vs. Everything series, there will be a card linked somewhere on the screen, probably before I even started talking about it. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.